Welcome back to the flow of money. We've developed the keys for wealth and those were earn more money, organize your affairs and pay less tax, gain control of and minimize expenses, ensure income is not lost on possessions and reduce possessions and hence triggered expenses. So if we actually want to create wealth, how should the money flow look? To make things a little simpler to understand, the diagram shown with actual figures, you can see that we're not creating any wealth because all of the money is being spent on purchases or expenses. We need our keys to wealth to create an excess. This uh, diagram describes a balanced cash flow where no savings are being made but no credit is needed. To create wealth we need to find an excess. Assume that we could reduce our expenses to $38,000 per annum. The diagram will look something like this. We would then have an excess of $2,400 per year that we could do something with. We'll continue this next week. Welcome back. Uh, we're joined by Alison Shaney from Integrity Business College, who's going to represent you in the reverse interview. Thank you for joining us, Alison. Thank you. Okay, now what popped out the first two uh, segments for you? What do you think needs clarification? You called the lizard brain the patterning brain. What do you mean? Okay, that's, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, what happens is that in the example we use, the bloke who just patterned and ran off wasn't eaten. Okay, so what happens is that there's a response and there's an immediate set of actions that occur from the response. That's the danger, truthfully, is that in investing in modern markets, we get a response that causes a set of actions which aren't to our best interest. So Edward de Bono is really interesting because he accepts that the brain patterns and has devised some strategies to avoid patterning. So if you're in a sales meeting and somebody says, how do you get more sales? Everyone's brain drops into the pattern and runs through. He says it's like, um, it's like having a tray of sand and a ball that runs down the tray of sand. We create the path for the ball by the way we think, but now every time that stimulus occurs, the ball runs down the same track. So nothing new is going to occur. So he has devised some strategies to get us thinking out of that and he calls them provocations. So it sounds strange, but if you wanted to find out how to get more sales, you would say, uh, you would equate that to a green frog or a, a blue cup or a, a fast car, it doesn't matter. So the idea is that if you talk about sales, you fall into the, the channel in the sand and you follow it. If you use a provocation, you fall somewhere else and you think with no channels. That's the idea. So, I don't know, using that provocation of a green frog, I don't know how successful it will be, but a, a green frog makes a noise, it croaks. So a way to get more sales is to, is to use sound in a, in a different way. So you can see that by using that provocation of a green frog, we've probably come to a solution that we wouldn't have done otherwise. So that patterning brain is really useful for our survival but not useful for original thought and not useful for modern markets. So how does a strategic approach fix this? Okay, that's cool. So what happens is that we were speaking before about prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking brain, and the amygdala, which is the lizard brain. That's the one that patterns. Um, now, strategic only works because we build the strategy with the prefrontal cortex. So as you and I sit down and we say, what are we going to do about this investment? How much... Australian shares, I want 25%. Do you want international shares? Yeah, yeah, we'll have 25%. How much cash? Oh, I don't want a lot of cash, 5%. So this is all reasoned, and we reason out exactly what we want. Then, when something happens that we find frightening, like markets falling occurs, we fall into that lizard brain and we say, I'm frightened, I'm frightened, I'm frightened, the only thing to do is sell. Um, now, because that strategy is written in the cool light of day, and as an advisor, I would caution the clients that once the strategy is set, we're never going to leave it. The people who are watching the show are doing it themselves. They need to give themselves the same, the same uh, statement. If we set a strategy, we follow it in all circumstance. So when the roof's falling in and the chicken little's running around and 
hurricanes are rolling in and the place is on fire, we don't do anything that our brain tells us to do under those circumstances. We fall back to the strategy. What that means is that we're behaving in a rational manner in an irrational market. Now that should protect us from the worst. It doesn't always, because if it was really that easy, people who use this approach would all be rich, and people who didn't would all be poor, but it doesn't work that way. What it does is protects us from ourselves. I'm sorry, the question, the answers are incredibly long. You're doing a, a good job asking <laughs> me a really sweet little short <laughs> question. Is there anything else that occurred to you? Nope. Okay. No, so. That means I've done a good job. Okay. Doesn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Alison, for joining us. Thank you. I think, as usual, our reverse interview has done a good job in relation to what the audience requires, so thank you very much. Not a problem. Thank you for joining us for Accumulation, um, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week where we'll be dealing with risk. We'll see you then. <laughs>